Now that we've covered how diplophagans evolved to their current form, we can get stuck into the details of their anatomy. Maybe you noticed that my speculative biology videos went into detail about how different clades breathe and how their skeletons work, but I glossed over all that with xenotetrapods. That was on purpose. Many diplophagan traits are typical among xenotetrapods. Some are more unusual, and others are completely unique, but today we'll cover almost all of them. Almost. Okay. Yeah. Whatever that means. Obviously, diplophagans are broadly humanoid. I've already talked about why that is. I've done aliens with more limbs before, and I just didn't want to do it again. Because of this, much of the process of creating diplophagans was an effort to make them less like us, to make them more alien. One strategy I've used for this before is mimicking primate evolution, but swapping out the ancestral lemur-like form for a different animal. Previously, I swapped lemurs for sloths. My sapient aliens ended up with long claws on their fingers and retractile claws on their toes. This time, I swapped out lemurs for diprodonts, which are an order of marsupials. Unfortunately, I don't think it was as effective. That's so upsetting. Starting with marsupials just resulted in pyasmachirids having pouches, some being crepuscular, and diplophagans having weird toes. Well, she tried. At least, you know, she... But I'm getting ahead of myself. Since diplophagans are so like humans, we can start exploring their anatomy with a bit of comparison. Firstly, the similarities. We have the overall body plan, as well as their digestive, immune, and cardiovascular systems. Both species are also endotherms and omnivores. Another similarity is that they have hair, but less of it than their relatives. This is because, like humans, as diplophagans evolved from their Magnapithecan ancestors, they became pedomorphic. I've mentioned this before, it's when adults of a species come to exhibit traits that were once exclusive to adolescents. This enlarged diplophagan craniums, increasing their intelligence, but it also cost them a good deal of body hair. Then, the differences. Obviously, diplophagans have eight eyes. Their blood also contains not hemoglobin, but hemorrhythrin. This transports oxygen through their blood just like hemoglobin, but without oxygen, it's colourless, and with oxygen, it's bright pinky purple. Only a few invertebrates on Earth have hemorrhythrin in their blood, and I realised a while after choosing it that it's only a quarter as efficient as hemoglobin. So, diplophagans probably have more of it in their blood than we have hemoglobin. Diplophagans also don't have noses. <laughs> Instead of nostrils, they breathe through two spiracles at the base of the neck. They also have six digits on each hand and foot, six toes and five fingers and a thumb. They had to be able to grasp in order to use tools, but I chose six fingers rather than, say, tentacles or crab-like claws, because most human number systems are base 10, likely because we have 10 digits on our hands and counting on the fingers is quite convenient. I wanted most diplophagan number systems to be base 12, so six digits was the choice for me. The last obvious difference between diplophagans and humans is that they have two different skin tones on different parts of their body, kind of like humans with vitiligo. In fact, which parts of the body are dark or light is one of the easiest ways to tell male and female diplophagans apart. Their skin is also a little purplish compared to ours due to the colour of their blood. Diplophagan and human skeletons are fairly similar. Their skulls are obviously different, with lots of eye sockets, massive temples, and sort of two sets of cheekbones. You'll also notice two pairs of eyes share their sockets. Those blue lines in the middle are a strut of cartilage, not actual bone. Their upper jaws also have two incisors, two canines, one premolar, and three molars on each side whereas we have one canine and two premolars, but their lower jaws are just like ours. I did consider some more interesting jaw designs, such as a hinged upper jaw with the lower jaw attached to the rest of the skull, basically flipping the skull upside down, 
or maybe one hinged jaw on either side. But unfortunately, I realized that if I changed their speech mechanisms too much, I wouldn't be able to pronounce Diplophag and Conlangs. So I begrudgingly gave them jaws like ours. Diplophagans also have two processes on one of their cervical vertebrae sticking forward on either side of the throat. These are attachment sites for muscles in the neck and floor of the mouth, like the root of the tongue. In humans, these muscles attach to the U-shaped hyoid bone that sits atop our larynx, but diplophagans don't have hyoids. Also, weirdly, diplophagan bones aren't all made of the same material. In aquatic ramosopods, most of the skeleton was cartilage, but when xenotetrapods came onto land, their bones mineralized to help support their bodies. This isn't too different from our bones. But diplophagan skulls and some bones in their necks and shoulders have four different layers. These bones are descended from the armor plates that cover the heads of diplophagan's gnathostome ancestors. These bones have an underlayer of cartilage, then a layer of blood vessels and nerves, covered with a layer of dentin. This is partly mineralized tissue found in human teeth, and its flexibility helps support the brittle outer layer made of ganoin. This stuff is about 95% apatite crystals, quite like human tooth enamel. This plate evolved into a bone like the scapula. In some xenotetrapods, it joins up to this bone, the mentesis, but for other clades, including diplophagans, it's just for muscle attachment. Humans don't have anything like this bone, the styloid minor, but it works with the styloid major to form a socket for the shoulder joint, making it harder to dislocate. This plate became a bone like our clavicles. In clades whose styloid major doesn't connect to the mentesis, this connects the shoulder to the rest of the skeleton. In the chest, the two mochloids join to an intermochloid, another bone humans don't have. In most xenotetrapods, this hinges with the sternum, providing a little more shoulder flexibility than we have. These two plates up here became a pair of bones connecting the skull to the spine. The mentesis hinges with the skull on each side, allowing a nodding motion. A process of the elytroid sticks into the gap in the C-shaped mentesis, allowing the head to pivot side to side. The elytroid connects to the first vertebra. The mentesis and elytroid are partly why diplophagans have such long necks, but I also just like how it looks. In fact, the long neck ended up having a pretty big impact on diplophagan proportions. When I first drew a diplophagan's full body, I used the proportions of da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, along with some other research. But because I'd already drawn the head and long neck, along with some intentional changes, and some mistakes, the rest of the body ended up quite warped, with super long arms, a broad torso, and large feet. It's a little weird, but I'm very happy with the result. I think it helps diplophagans look less like they're just humans wearing rubber masks. Oh my god! What is that? Also, humans have two bones in each forearm and calf. The radius and ulna in the arm, and the tibia and fibula in the leg. The radius and ulna are quite weird for crossing over each other when we rotate our wrists, so I made diplophagan limbs a little simpler. They have just one bone in each forearm and calf, with a ball at the wrist or ankle. The sockets for these joints are formed by multiple small bones in the ankles and wrists. This allows similar flexibility to ours, but it's a little less bizarre. At least, if you ask me. You know, that's just my opinion. Everybody got an opinion, everybody got something to say. The last oddity of the diplophagan skeleton is their toes. The second and third toe are actually fused up to the first joint, which helped their arboreal ancestors at climbing. This is one of the traits they got from my basing their ancestors on diprodont marsupials. They also don't have toenails, their toes instead being supported by broad, flattened bones. Diplophagan's senses are a little different from ours. Their eight eyes give them quite strong vision and a larger field of view than we have. Their sort of W-shaped pupils were inspired by cuttlefish. Early ramosopods had simple eyes and eventually developed eyelids to control the amount of light coming in. 
protective lenses developed over these, essentially merging the eyelids into the eyeballs as irises. I mentioned last time that many chiasmochirids were crepuscular, including early diplophagans. To aid this lifestyle, one of their pairs of eyes developed a tapetum lucidum, a reflective membrane in the eye to help them see in low light, like cats have. Even though Diplophagus sapiens are diurnal, they still have their tapetum lucidum, which makes it easier for them to do things after dark without artificial light. Although, night vision often comes at the cost of colour vision. A normal Diplophagon can only see the colours that humans with red-green colour blindness can see, which is roughly what cats and dogs can see too. Diplophagons also have massive ears. This was mostly just for visual interest, but strong hearing would have been useful for their crepuscular ancestors too, so it'd make sense if they could hear better than we can. Since I gave Diplophagans strong hearing and vision, I figured it was only fair to make their senses of smell and taste weaker than ours. This isn't a huge deal, it probably just means that many humans would be overwhelmed by food or perfume made by Diplophagans. Another weird thing with Diplophagan's nervous systems is that they don't have a corpus callosum, which is the big bundle of nerves connecting the halves of the human brain. Instead, they have multiple smaller connections between the two halves. I did this because Diplophagans don't have handedness like we do, and there might be a link between the corpus callosum and handedness? Seriously, I couldn't tell for sure. It seems like a hot topic in neuroscience right now. In any case, most Diplophagans are more dexterous in their left hands, but stronger in their right hands, but some are the other way around. And as much as I'd love to get into it now, Diplophagan psychology is a story for another day. You need a lot of psychological evaluations. Diplophagan's respiratory system is one of the bigger differences between them and us. Unlike vertebrates, early Romosopod's gills were on the outside of their bodies. Later clades developed protective membranes over the gills, then flaps of skin with slits to let water flow in and out. Some developed muscles that pumped water through the gills, allowing them to grow larger or spend more time lying still. In xenotetrapods, the gill tubes merged as one big lung. The slits for water intake developed into spiracles, and the muscles that pumped water through the gills developed into a diaphragm. Early swamp-dwelling xenotetrapods faced a new problem, though. Their spiracles were on the underside of their bodies, where they were often underwater or blocked by mud. This was solved by a new airway connecting to their throats, allowing them to breathe through their mouths, but also creating the risk of choking on food. So a flap or epiglottis could cut off the airway for safe swallowing. The spiracles and lung being on the same side of the epiglottis also meant that they could breathe and swallow at the same time, which humans can't do. Mm, very good. Early malleoderms developed a larynx, not in the throat like humans, but down in the chest. The larynx's position allows diplophagans to make speech sounds from their mouths and spiracles. I guess this means that nasal consonants in their languages would be called spiraculars? Their speech will likely sound a little different to ours too, but it's close enough. Alright, that's the skeletal, nervous, and respiratory systems done. The digestive, cardiovascular, and immune systems aren't too interesting, so I guess that's it. Wait a damn minute. <laughs> okay, you got me. I've skipped over the reproductive system. Um, ciao. That's because it's easily the biggest difference between diplophagans and humans, and it deserves an in-depth video of its own. Gross, I know. I didn't intend to go for the weird alien reproduction trope while making diplophagans, it just kind of happened. After all, the nature of our reproductive systems has a huge impact on our cultures, but that's even more of a story for another time. Anyway. Next video, we talk about aliens making babies. Not exactly something I always dreamt of putting on the internet, but here we are. And on, friends.